Okay, so uh, for anyone that is uh, here, I'm Tom. I'm one of the core surgical trainees at Bath, and uh, just like thank Dan uh, for inviting me to do this short radiology teaching on hips. And um, so, just to qualify the whole thing, I, I'm not a <clears throat> radiologist, uh, but hopefully through the session you can pick up some nuggets of uh, new information you didn't know before. Uh, Drawing out a little bit of a scope of what we'll talk about this morning, we'll go over some very basic anatomy um, and then we'll get straight into the meat of it with hip fractures, a bit on dislocations, a couple of normal variants and then we'll do a very small amount of uh, paediatric stuff at the end that you might get asked to, to look at uh, when you're in ED. And I've also sort of put at the bottom some of the important areas that I haven't really gone into because they sort of are, you know, vast topics in themselves. Um, so there's a sort of the prostheses, your, your total and uh, hemiarthroplasties, um, all the various metal work. Um, I haven't gone into too much detail about pathological lesions. And uh, although I've touched on some paediatric stuff at the end, I haven't gone into paediatric trauma. So just a very basic revision of some anatomy that I'm sure all of you will be uh, pretty comfortable with. <clears throat> um, this obviously shows the whole uh, pelvis, um, obviously focusing on the hip, comprised of your acetabulum, your cup-shaped uh, saucer, and then you've got your femoral head. Unlike something like the shoulder, which is another ball and socket joint, this is very congruent, so it's inherently a lot more stable. Um, the femoral neck, of course, which we'll sort of focus on for hip fractures. This label here denotes the intertrochanteric crest, which is important when we want to then classify uh, whether fractures are intra or extra capsular. You've got your greater trochanter over here, lesser on the inside. Um, trochanter is a useful landmark for trying to get a, a bit of an assessment on the rotation of the femur. Um, yeah, I think that's the main point of this. This is a lateral, which I actually this is more of an oblique view to be honest, but the lateral has always been a bit of an intimidating view, I think, uh, often quite difficult to interpret, but it's very useful. Just remember, for when you're trying to work out whether what's anterior and posterior, you've got your um, ischial tuberosity. It's always going to be at the back. So now you know this is the anterior. And then you've got your trochanters here, femoral shaft, femoral head here. So just to zoom in on the hip, one of the things we obsess out in orthopedics is whether uh, these factors are intra or extra capsular. Uh, this watershed landmark is the intertrochanteric line. So anything north of that proximal would be deemed intracapsular. Anything more distal is going to be extracapsular. And the reason that it's important is because of the blood supply of the, the femur, which I'm sure you've heard before. But essentially, it's retrograde. So you've got your femoral artery that comes down. Then give up your medial and lateral circumflex arteries, and they then move up the femoral neck to supply the head. There is also blood supply from the um, round ligament, which is a, uh, from the uh, obturator artery. But in adulthood, um, less less of an important blood supply. And so if you end up with an intracapsular fracture, this blood supply is often disrupted, and then you end up predisposing yourself to avascular necrosis. Um, hence, we often replace those as opposed to fix them. Key difference, of course, is if, if you're young, um, in which case you're going to want to try, probably try at least fixing it, even if you know there's a chance it's going to fail. So let's go into some examples. So here it's, I think, admittedly fairly subtle, but if you've got an, what we'd call a sort of subcapital necathema fracture, um, if you follow you can see that there's a bit of increased radial density at the bottom of the head here. Um, also, if you follow, for example, the normal side here, you've got a nice 
curve. This is sentence lines, which you may have heard of before. Whereas that then becomes disrupted on the left hand side. And then if we look at the lateral, again, sometimes difficult to interpret, but what, you, where, what in all radiology, basically all you're looking for is unusual steps. And you can probably see a, a small little step here, again, indicating a fracture there. This is intracapsular, so that's going to need replacing. OK, uh, another plain film, AP pelvis, and we've got here a basic cervical uh, megafemur fracture. <clears throat> so I, I always find these quite difficult to sometimes differentiate between a sort of intertruck and teric or basic cervical, but if, hopefully you can agree that the, here you've got the lesser trochanter still intact. We've got um, the greater trochanter still in track, in, intact, and the fracture pattern is going to be somewhere along here. Unfortunately, I have a, a lateral of this. Um, and this is probably just within the reams of uh, being able to fix. So this is an example of an intertrochanteric fracture. Now, I've sort of shown you both images here, but uh, this is the uh, AP. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got the contract to show, but hopefully you'll agree that there really is not a lot to to see. Um, you, you're doing just, you know, all, all of these uh, images have got to be interpreted in the sort of clinical context. So you've got someone here that's fallen over and they're complaining of some right hip pain. You've done your uh, x-ray and you're just tracing around looking for uh, an often it's all the trabecular seem to line up nicely. There's not a huge hint at all of anything untoward there. However, you go to get another view. This is actually an oblique view rather than a lateral. But hopefully you can now see this crack here. And there are all sorts of different patterns you can get for intertrock and tear. They can be what's called um, standard oblique, which is uh, in this orientation, you can get reverse oblique, which is like this. Um, you can get them in various different uh, configurations and uh, multi-fragments as well. And finally, apologies, it's not a great image. Uh, we've got uh, subtrochanteric, so that is classed as anything below the lesser trochanter, up to five centimetres below. After that, they're called um, femoral shaft fractures. Um, this has a classic deformity where you get the proximal fragment which is pulled up and out. Um, and then meanwhile, your femoral shaft distally will get pulled medially by your uh, adductors here. Uh, and here you can see the letter trochanters come off as well. Um, importantly with these, when you're in ED, just be aware that uh, I mean, not so much in the very acute phase, but these got, will tend to bleed a lot. Um, so it's worth making a, a note of the HB when they come in. Uh, this is another subtrochanteric fracture, and this is slightly different. Uh, hopefully you can appreciate that the fracture site doesn't look entirely normal. So it's got a sort of moth-eaten appearance. If you look at the distal fragment, you can see it's not of a nice uniform density. It's got this, again, moth-eaten appearance and this radiolucency extending down. Um, and the same can be seen on the lateral. So I put this in here because, and I know I'd said I wouldn't talk about uh, pathological lesions so much, but and um, just be aware that these are the sort of lesions that uh, this is a pathological lesion essentially this is a patient with known um, multiple myeloma uh, so key things for this are to, to know whether it was hurting before they fractured it often you find they have a, a fairly low uh, energy mechanism of injury uh, I put this one in for. 
Uh, this is for um, greater trochanter fractures. So yeah, it's quite subtle, but on the on the right, you've got a um, greater trochanter fracture. Uh, these can be isolated, uh, in which case they're managed conservatively. They've got a sort of bimodal distribution where you've got young people that will tend to be high energy, sort of avulsion type injuries. And you've got older people, which will tend to be full and direct. Um, almost always managed conservatively, especially in your sort of frail elderly patients. Just be aware that they can extend uh, and they can become intertrochanteric fractures. So just um, have a low threshold for looking more into that. Um, and as, as I said, you know, colorate sort of clinically. Uh, I've put this in because you'll get someone that, you know, fairly that can't tell you what's happened. They've got hip pain. <clears throat> you do an x-ray and you're doing your best and you're tracing around. You can't see any fractures. Um, look for pubic rami fractures. This uh, lady has a superior and inferior pubic rami fracture. So that's just a sort of another thing to look out for. Uh, and then also as another sort of while we're looking at any area, <coughs> uh, be aware of acetabular fractures. So again, these, this is a bit strange. That the both femur seem to be uh, quite externally rotated, uh, so you can't really see the neck. But um, hopefully you can see if, if you're tracing the inside of the pelvic rim here, you can see a small step uh, indicating acetabular fracture, um, which will almost certainly need a further evaluation because um, it will dictate whether you can uh, weight bear them or not. Oh, that's a bit of a rubbish slide, isn't it? Um, so hip dislocations. Um, again, uh, are normally of a native hip, a high energy uh, trauma. So you're not going to see a huge amount of them. Uh, classically, it's when you're uh, in a, a car, <clears throat> you have your, your hips flexed, your knees bent, dashboard comes in and your top of your femoral head is pushed out the back of your uh, out the back of your pelvis. 90% uh, are posterior um, and 95% are associated with other injuries whether that's vascular, neurovascular, other fractures of the acetabulum. So, um, yeah, really thorough examination. You're almost certainly going to be looking at this person in, a, in an ATLS uh, scenario. <clears throat> uh, this one is actually fairly subtle um, as they go. But if you scrutinise the ephemeral head, you notice it's slightly smaller. And that's due to a sort of magnification effect because it's posterior. And... Hopefully you can see that it's not quite congruent with the uh, with the hip joint. And that will need sort of uh, emergent reduction within sort of six hours. Uh, make sure you want actually before to make sure there aren't any fractures um, before you reduce it. Um, afterwards, you're almost you're going to get a CT as well, because as I said, you're very likely to have other associated injuries with that. And uh, it's the only bit of metal work I put in the slide show, but you're more likely to see dislocations in the context of uh, prostheses. This is a hemiarthroplasty because there is no uh, acetabular component. Uh, greatest risk of dislocation is going to be within a year after uh, implantation. After that risk slowly goes down, um, but it's sort of ever present. Um, oh, and then we've got a total hip as well. That's the acetabular component there. Okay. A couple of normal variants. Uh, yeah, these phleboliths, which is calcified lesions within the walls of um, uh, veins within the pelvis, or you get sort of calcified lymph nodes. Um, and then this is called an os acetabuli, which is uh, just a calcified, it's almost like heterotropic ossification around the hip joint. Um, normal variant, but it's not concerning because, of course, it's nicely corticated. It's, it doesn't look jagged like it's been uh, fractured. I've never, I can't remember seeing one myself. But uh, so, conscious of time, it's sort of gone to 20 minutes. I'll just very quickly do the paediatric stuff. So, paediatrics, 
when you first look at them, you're like, oh my goodness, where's half their pelvis gone? Uh, you've got your ossification centers um, of your femoral head. This is meant to be sort of one year, but actually you can see them quite a lot earlier. Uh, this is, I think, a, a nine month old. Uh, and then you've got 11 month old. And then finally, this is an older child here. The greater jacanta, which you can't see here, but here will appear around four years old. Um, very briefly, these are pretty rare conditions, but you've got um, Perthes disease or leg calvis Perthes disease, which is a, basically a form of avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Uh, you see it in two to 15 year olds, but more commonly four to eight year olds, and it has a quite insidious onset, uh, might present with like a painless limp, uh, and they get intermittent pain in the hip, knee, groin. With kids, always be suspicious when you've got knee pain that there's something might be going with the hip. Uh, so have a low threshold for getting some imaging of that. And the combination, they might have a sort of irritable hip, might be a bit stiff. They might like internal rotation. Uh, on the radiographs, you're looking for a, a thinned or a compressed uh, epiphysis, which you can see on the on the left here compared to the right. And then finally, uh, Sufis. So slipped upper femoral epiphysis, the Americans call them slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Uh, it's when you get a, a sort of shearing injury at the uh, physis. And so the epiphysis then slips off the metaphysis here. Uh, to assess for this, you look for Klein's line, line of Klein, where you draw a line from along the femoral neck and then it should intersect the epiphysis. If it doesn't, then you'd be suspicious that it's slipped off. Uh, so on this, you can see it's slightly reduced on the right hand side. And here you can see that this Klein's line here doesn't intersect here. The classic patient for this is uh, an obese adolescent male, 10 to 16 years old. Um, maybe sort of traumatic and again, they'll present with um, a limp and some groin and thigh pain. Um, males slightly more than females, apparently left more than right. And to be aware, of course, in, uh, in 70 to 50%, they are bilateral. Um, and this is also, uh, you may have heard of frog leg views being done in paediatrics. This is a useful in time to do it. This is an AP pelvis of an adolescent child and not a lot to be seen. However, when you do the frog leg view, suddenly you see that on the right hand side, you've got that tiny little slip of the epiphysis, um, which you wouldn't have picked up on the AP. So make sure you're getting at least one view. Um, and that's it. Um, hopefully I can answer some questions now. <laughs>